This is a uh, side chair, meaning it's not an armchair. <laughs> doesn't have arms. Um, much more interestingly, um, it's a Hitchcock chair. Now, Hitchcock chairs are both known as chairs that were made by the Hitchcock Company or Lambert Hitchcock, initially the entrepreneur in Connecticut. Uh, but more significantly, there are a certain genre of chairs. So lots of different painted chairs of the first half of the 19th century, uh, sort of festooned with lots of uh, cornucopia and sort of gold stenciling, um, cane seats, uh, were known as Hitchcock chairs. So it's got a larger sort of import uh, because of that. But it's extremely popular. Uh, you can still find lots of these in antique shops. What I find really interesting uh, about it, first of all, is the decoration. And I think that's what it was meant to say. It's a decorated chair, not just a plain black chair. What I know from my own prior knowledge, of course, is that often painted decoration uh, stands in for sort of other kinds of decoration. In earlier chairs, uh, one would have used a rich carving, which takes a lot of experience by the artisan. So here, instead of having rich depth in the carving, we have two things uh, which stand in for that three-dimensionality. We have uh, turnings. This is done on a lathe. Uh, these are done uh, also mass-produced so that these parts are relatively interchangeable. So at the same time as these Hitchcock chairs are being mass-produced, $1.50 a piece, usually sold in sets, uh, someone like Eli Terry in the Connecticut clock industry is also making cheap shelf clocks by relatively interchangeable parts so that the gears and the clocks uh, are made all at once and then can be fit into a variety of different clocks. Um, so that obviously is going to cut down uh, on costs. And also on the skill level for the chair workers assembling the chair. So much of the work is really done by semi-skilled uh, workers rather than an older style where one person made one chair at a time. In some uh, chair industries, uh, they would have made some parts at the sawmill. They would have then made other parts uh, or assembled them in a shop. And then third, they would have had women and children seating the chairs by hand uh, in homes and then collected everything uh, together. Um, so in the case of Hitchcock's innovation, sort of like the Lowell Mills, is that he did everything together in a factory which really allowed him uh, great uh, advances in terms of um, scale, um, savings by scale. When you look in the back, on the back of the seat, it will say uh, Hitchcock uh, wa uh, warranted. Um, and so it's got a stencil on the back. This is the first entrepreneur to do this, that there's a sort of warranted uh, that if you know, you do, there's a problem with this, you can sort of return them. So again, it's this assumption, and this is a new stage, that these will be distributed throughout the United States. Uh, there will not be a face-to-face -face encounter between maker and consumer so that you would need to have this sort of publicized warranty in a way that if you actually knew the craftsman 20 years earlier, you wouldn't need that sort of published stamped warranty. What Hitchcock's great idea was to take a bit of this and a bit of that, put it together, push it forward with division of labor, um, and also extensive marketing and really produce something that's a prototype uh, of a sort of mass-produced object that bespeaks uh, gentility uh, to a wide section of the American public from top to bottom uh, and do it at a really low price. And that really is what accounts for the popularity of the chair at the time and I think also its significance uh, for us to sort of look at and talk about.